Hi, this is Michael Altos. We are continuing our discussion of the autonomic nervous system, and this is recording part three. Now let's talk about the sympathetic nervous system and the adrenergic receptors. There are several different kinds of receptors, alpha and beta, and there are also dopaminergic receptors. The alpha receptors are further subdivided into alpha-1 and alpha-2. The alpha-1 receptors are only found on the postsynaptic membrane, and this is usually at the target organ, and they are the most abundant alpha receptor. They are excitatory receptors. When they are activated, they increase intracellular calcium, and this leads to constriction of the smooth muscle in the coronary arteries, the skin, the uterus, the intestines, the renal and splanchnic circulation. It causes constriction of the vessels, but relaxation in the GI system. Again, this is the fight or flight response. So this is not the time for the GI system to be active, and it gets relatively turned off in response to alpha stimulation. There's also some increased con cardiac contractility with alpha-1 stimulation. The alpha-2 receptors are actually quite complex, and there are a lot of subtypes. In general, for our purposes, let's think of it as an inhibitory receptor. It decreases cyclic AMP in the cell. And again, for our purposes, there are two main places that we will see alpha-2 adrenergic receptors. Postsynaptic receptors will be found um, on arteries and veins, leading to vasoconstriction. They'll also be found on platelets, which is involved in platelet aggregation. And the alpha-2 receptor is involved in inhibition of insulin release and gut motility and inhibition of antidiuretic hormone. The other place that you should very much remember that there's an alpha-2 receptor is on the presynaptic terminal. And this is the negative feedback receptor. When the alpha-2 receptor uh, is stimulated by norepinephrine, it inhibits the release of additional norepinephrine, reduces sympathetic outflow, and this leads to vasodilation and also sedation. The beta receptors all increase cellular cyclic AMP. The beta-1 receptor is postsynaptic, and beta-1 is mostly in the heart. And the mnemonic to remember that is Beta-1 for one heart, because most people have only one heart. When the beta receptor is activated, we see increased heart rate, contractility. We also see release of renin, coronary dilation, and it is affected by both epinephrine and norepinephrine pretty equally. The beta-2 receptors are also mostly postsynaptic. They tend to be a little bit more inhibitory. So we see vasodilation, bronchodilation, renal vessel relaxation. These are stimulated a little bit more by epinephrine than norepinephrine, and they tend to be stimulated by circulating epinephrine instead of direct sympathetic activity coming from a sympathetic neuron. There are some cardiac effects, so we will see a little bit of increased heart rate and contractility, and there are some presynaptic effects where stimulation by epinephrine will, ac will accelerate release of norepinephrine, and also cause some vasoconstriction. The mnemonic I use for beta-2 is that the 2 is for two lungs. So beta-1 is mostly in the heart, beta-2 is primarily in the lungs, although we do see these other effects as well. Dopamine receptors are pretty much limited to the kidneys, and they are involved in increasing renal perfusion and diuresis. Just a few other comments I'd like to make. There's a lot of different selectivity and specificity for various adrenergic receptors. There can be overlapping activity at different receptors, and the balance of activity can shift at different doses. So it's hard to say very specific um, unchanging rules about the activity of various adrenergic receptors at specific tissues. We do see some changes based on the situation. The first adrenergic agonist that we'll discuss is phenylephrine, or neosinephrine. This is predominantly an alpha agonist. It's about as pure alpha-1 as you can get. And so its primary effect is to cause peripheral vasoconstriction in both the venous and the arterial vasculature. 
When this occurs, it will increase Venus return and increase stroke volume by increasing preload. As for the heart rate, we will see bradycardia, and this is a reflex bradycardia. It's a vagal reflex, probably mediated through the baroreceptors. And so if uh, blood pressure goes up, and, and therefore we see preload going up, but heart rate goes down, so cardiac output doesn't change too much in most patients. There's also probably some increased coronary blood flow when patients receive phenylephrine. A vial of phenylephrine is very concentrated. It's a 1% solution, so it's 10 milligrams per milliliter. And we never give a milligram of, even a milligram of phenylephrine. So usually it's diluted. Um, it can, you can put the 10 milligrams into 250 milliliters, and then you'll have a concentration of 40 micrograms per milliliter. Or you could put 10 milligrams into 100 milliliters and you'll have 100 micrograms per milliliter. And if you have a syringe that's been prepared of phenylephrine, it will usually be one of these two concentrations, either 40 or 100 micrograms per milliliter, depending on your institution. A normal bolus of phenylephrine to treat transient hypotension would be somewhere between 40 to 120 mics or 50 to 100 if you're using the concentrated solution. We can also run phenylephrine as a continuous infusion to help support blood pressure. Typical doses would be somewhere between 0.25 and 1 microgram per kilogram per minute. This is about 37.5 to 150 milliliters per hour. At higher doses, this vasoconstriction will decrease renal perfusion. We do see some tachyphylaxis with phenylephrine, which means that over time patients will be less responsive to the same dose and may need their dose titrated upwards to get the same effect. But we don't see as much tachyphylaxis with this as we do with ephedrine. This leads us to a discussion of ephedrine. Most people understand the primary mechanism of ephedrine is that it is an indirect acting adrenergic agonist, and it has an effect similar to norepinephrine. What this means is ephedrine first inhibits norepinephrine, norepinephrine reuptake, and it also causes release of norepinephrine from vesicles. So it indirectly causes norepinephrine to have a action on the body. There's more norepinephrine in the synapse, and it's there for longer periods of time. Its vasoconstricting effect is primarily on the arterial system. And as we mentioned earlier, Ephedrine does demonstrate rapid tachyphylaxis, and this is understandable because it is due to the depletion of norepinephrine stores. There are other mechanisms for ephedrine. It has some direct acting adrenergic agonist effect, and in that case, it looks a little bit more like epinephrine than norepinephrine. It activates alpha and beta receptors, and that's why we don't see reflex bradycardia when we administer ephedrine. This vasoconstricting effect is more on the venous system, which causes a redistribution of blood centrally, and that improves venous return and preload. Overall, ephedrine looks a lot like epi. We see an increase in blood pressure, heart rate, some increase in inotropy, and even some bronchodilation. But unlike epinephrine, ephedrine has a much longer duration of effect, about 10 times longer than what we see with epinephrine. For many years, ephedrine was the drug of choice in OB anesthesia. When patients became hypotensive from their epidurals or their spinals, everybody thought that ephedrine was the best drug because it preserved uterine blood flow better than the direct acting alpha agonists. The data now shows that that is not true and that in fact phenylephrine may be preferable. But we always need to take a step back and look at the big picture and consider that reflex bradycardia that we get when we give phenylephrine. And if a patient has a sympathectomy because they have a high epidural or a high spinal, if it gets high enough, the patient may actually become bradycardic from their anesthetic. And then you go ahead and give phenylephrine and you may make them even more bradycardic. So sometimes ephedrine could be the better choice. And we always need to think about what's best for the patient, what's best for the fetus in patients who are pregnant, and what will be the side effects of our treatment, whether it's tachycardia or bradycardia. 
Ephedrine may have some anti-emetic properties, and you can give 25 milligrams intramuscular in order to help prevent nausea. This is not just due to its blood pressure effect, but it seems to be a separate effect in the brain. A bolus dose of ephedrine is usually 5 or 10 milligrams IV. Norepinephrine, also called levofed, acts primarily at the alpha-1 receptor, where it causes direct alpha stimulation. Of course, this leads to arterial and venous vasoconstriction. It also does cause pulmonary vasoconstriction, especially at higher doses. We may see reflex bradycardia, like we do with phenylephrine, but this may be offset by some of the beta-1 mediated tachycardia that also occurs with this drug. So it's primarily an alpha-1 agonist, but there are other actions which have a smaller effect in norepinephrine. There is alpha-2 stimulation, which can cause transient hypertension due to the action at postsynaptic alpha-2 receptors. And you may also see some negative feedback hypotension due to action at the alpha-2 presynaptic receptors. Beta-1 activity can increase contractility, cause a transient increase in heart rate, although, as we said before, this may be offset by the reflex bradycardia. And there is even some beta-2 stimulation, which may cause some vascular smooth muscle relaxation. As a result, the overall effect is a strong increase in blood pressure, little change or perhaps a slight increase in heart rate, and possibly less pulmonary vasoconstriction than we would see with a pure alpha-1 agonist such as phenylephrine. Norepinephrine, therefore, is used to treat refractory hypotension in cases of shock or sepsis. <clears throat> Norepinephrine will decrease blood flow to the renal and splanchnic, or GI, beds, thus leading to potential ischemia or necrosis of the gut, the extremities, and renal ischemic injury at higher or prolonged doses. There may also be increased myocardial oxygen requirements. In order for patients to respond best to norepinephrine, we need to ensure that there is adequate intravascular volume resuscitation. Because this drug is primarily alpha more than beta activity, it's not really a good first-line treatment for cardiogenic shock. For that, you would want to use an inotrope like epinephrine or dobutamine. Norepinephrine is commonly dosed as a continuous infusion, starting somewhere between, between 0 0.01 and 0 0.1 micrograms per kilogram per minute, although people have certainly gone to higher doses when needed. This drug should preferentially be given through central access because if it extravasates into peripheral tissues, it can cause significant tissue necrosis. Vasopressin should be discussed together with norepinephrine. Even though it's not a catecholamine, it is a sympathomimetic drug which activates smooth muscle V1 receptors. It can be used to support blood pressure in cases of septic shock, cardiac arrest, post-cardiopulmonary bypass vasoplegia, or the vasoplegia that is seen in patients who take ACE inhibitors, often in the perioperative period. It is an effective vasoconstrictor as it binds to vascular smooth muscle, typically dosed as an infusion at 2 to 4 units per hour, or 0.01 to 0.04 units per minute. Again, should be given preferentially through central access in order to avoid the complications of extravasation. Historically, vasopressin was part of the ACLS protocol, where a 40-unit bolus was given in pulseless arrest. It's no longer in, those, in the most current guidelines. Vasopressin is essentially an exogen exogenous version of ADH, of antidiuretic hormone, which is secreted from the pituitary gland. It causes water to be reabsorbed from the renal collecting ducts and go into the extracellular fluid. It can also be used in the treatment of diabetes insipidus, 
in patients who lack secretion of ADH. Of course, other vascular beds are affected by vasopressin, so we may see vasoconstriction of the skin, skeletal muscle, intestine, and adipose tissue, decreased splanchnic blood flow, which could lead to elevated liver enzymes, abdominal or uterine cramping and nausea, and lactic acidosis could theoretically develop if ischemia is severe enough. Advantages of vasopressin include minimal vasoconstriction or even possibly vasodilation of pulmonary vasculature in adults, making it an excellent vasopressor in patients with pulmonary hypertension. We also see that vasopressin may perform better than catecholamines under conditions of hypoxia and acidosis. So patients with severe perturbations in their blood gas may respond better to vasopressin as a vasopressor of choice. Let's stop here with our discussion of the adrenergic receptor, and we will continue in the next recording.